Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the GIST Silipari seminars. Uh, we're very glad to have Dr. Hali Han, who is a NASA postdoctoral fellow in the Earth Surface and Interior Group at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since January 2024. Uh, prior to joining JPL, Hali was a postdoctoral research fellow at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and uh, she completed her honorable uh, bachelor's in physics at the University of Toronto and her PhD in earth and planetary sciences at McGill University in Canada. And Holly's research interests lie in understanding how the cryosphere interacts with its bounding spheres across a range of spatial and temporal scales. Uh, outside of science, Holly loves coffee, writing, soccer, Taekwondo, training at the gym, and exploring the world and nature in any possible form. Uh, and she will be speaking today on the topic improving projections of sea level uh, of ice sheet contribution to sea level through modeling interactions between ice sheet, sea level, and solid earth using E3SM. So, welcome, Holly. Thank you so much, Patrick, for the introduction, and thank you everyone for being here. I'll First, share my screen and see if that works fine. Okay, how's everything looking good? All right. So, yeah, thank you again, Patrick, for inviting me to speak at the NASA DSC Level Rise Seminar. I myself is a big fan of the seminar series, and I'm very excited to give a talk here today. And um, I'll be talking about improving projections of Antarctic ice sheet um, through modeling interactions between ice sheet, sea level, and the solid Earth using the model E3SM. And even though I'm, I'm based at JPL right now, I'm uh, this work has been done at Los Alamos, along with my postdoc mentors at um, Los Alamos, Matthew Hoffman and Tyler S. A. Davis, and scientist Trevor Hillebrand and uh, Mauro Perigo, who is based in Sandia National Laboratories. So uh, quickly, the outline of the talk will be um, just a little bit about introduction of sea level change and its sources and budget. And I'll focus on to um, on barostatic changes and spatial and temporal variabilities of sea level change. And then I'll go into physics and modeling of these interactions between ice sheet sea level and the solid earth. And I'll show primarily um, my results based on using the E3SM, applying the coupled ice sheet sea level model under the ISNIP 6 2300 Antarctic ice sheet experimental critical, which has been recently finished and submitted to a journal, and um, go into conclusions. So, first, uh, I, I think everyone pretty much knows um, this basic, but I'll, I'll still go through it. Um, the sources of sea level change, we have different components that affects a sea level change. And the first is, well, sea level changes because there is ocean mass changes and anything associated, associated with mass changes, we call it barostatic changes. And that could be due to changes in land ice, mountain glaciers, terrestrial water sources, or sea level can change because there's changes in volume. Um, so steric changes such as density and salinity changes. And there is also sea level change due to changes in bounding surfaces. So either sea level changes because there's changes in sea surface height due to um, ocean current, tide and storm surge, or due to changes in the solid earth surface. So um, all these sea level change components all work and on different spatial and temporal scales, and therefore they have different spatial fingerprints. This plot shows global sea level budget um, that's been observed between 1993 and 2020. The orange line shows the thermal expansion trend changes observed by Argo, and green is mass increase trend observed by GRACE and GRACE follow on. So when you add these together, that's uh, the, you get yellow line. 
And that's the total. So that's sum of global ocean mass uh, changes and thermal expansion. And this blue line is the total sea level trend observed by altimetry. So we can pretty much close the gap between the yellow line and the blue line and explain the global sea level budget. And we can see that the pattern um, has been dominated by mass change over longer time scale, even though thermal expansion has uh, contributed significantly to global mean sea level change. So this mass change is primarily associated with um, ice sheets, mountain glaciers, terrestrial water sources, but ice sheets are the major source of sea level rise in the future. And so just to briefly touch on ice mass balance, it's simply um, just how much ice or mass is built up over how much um, mass goes out. So we have this schematic graph of ice sheet sitting on land and losing its, ma uh, losing its mass uh, through um, this flux across grounding line, um, so into the ocean. And so you can get ice mass um, build up due to precipitation and lose mass due to surface melting or sublimation or calving at the um, at the calving front. So we can model this using ice sheet model. And there are a couple of uh, important ingredients in ice sheet modeling. One is climate forcing. So how much precipitation we get and how much melt happens and how much um, of melting and freezing happens at the ocean as well. And there is this dynamical, dynamical core where it sol solves for conservation of mass and mo momentum and energy. And there are different physical processes that one can include in their ice sheet model, um, such as ice bird calving or basal sliding or ice sheet and ocean interaction. So that's happening at the boundary surfaces of ice and ocean, and also ice sheet, solid earth, and sea level interactions. That's also happening here. So that's what I'm focusing on in my research. And just to uh, explain a little more on what that is, ice sheet models typically assume um, either fixed or no sea level, and also typically assume fixed bedrock, especially ice, sheets, uh, ice sheet models that are um, built for predicting future projections. So I'll get into a little bit of a uh, little bit of more details into that as well. But uh, in reality, when ice sheets evolve, sea level also changes, and then the solid earth underneath the ice sheet also changes as well. So you really need to capture these different feed, uh, different feedback mechanisms that can influence ice sheet dynamics. So that being said, um, I'll touch on physics and modeling of barostatic sea level change. So I just wanted to first note that in this talk, the definition of sea level I'll use is basically the height difference between the sea surface height geoid and the solid surface. And so this pattern of sea level change on the left is due to melting Greenland ice sheet. And on the right is melt due to melting West Antarctic ice sheet. And the color bar represents normalized um, sea level change. So that means that these um, changes are, these changes happen when you melt ice sheet from these respective locations by uh, one meter of global mean sea level equivalent. So you can see that when you um, melt Greenland ice sheet, this gray, gray region is where the color bar gets saturated towards the negative sign. So it means that sea level actually falls in the vicinity of melting ice in Greenland. And as you go farther away, you have this gradient going from sea level rise below global average, so one meter. So this blue, blue region is where sea level rises below one meter. And then red, a yellow and red is where it gets higher than uh, sea level, where sea level rises higher than one meter, and vice versa. West Antarctica as well. You can see that there is sea level fall in um, the near field, 
And then as you go farther away from a Chattartika, you rise sea level um, more and more, more than global sea level, global mean sea level value. So why do we get this sea level fingerprint associated with um, specific geometry of ice sheet melting? Um, that is due to what is called gravitational, rotational, deformational effects, also called GRD effects. And this schematic graph it represents pretty well um, on GRD effect. So say that you melt ice sheet from this dashed line to the solid line. And the and when you melt ice sheet, land-based ice sheet, there is first this viscoelastic deformation of the solid earth. So the solid earth goes upwards from dash line to solid line. At the same time, there is some gravitational perturbation. So sea surface height geoid follows the gravity field. And because there has been weakening of gravitational attraction between ice and ocean due to melting ice, the sea surface height near the melting ice drops. And also further away it goes, the sea surface height rises more than just global average. So together, the sea surface height drop and the solid surface uplift together causes local sea level fall near retreating ice sheet. That's why we saw this um, fingerprints previously. And at the same time, there's this rotational effect. So when you melt, um, for example, ice from the West Antarctica, then the rotational um, vector is going to shift towards the missing mass causing this quadrantial pattern. So you can see that this red region is where you are going to, uh, where sea level is going to fall and the blue region is where sea level is going to rise. And when you impose this GRD effects or special fingerprints associated with GRD effects together, and then that's that's where we, that's why you get this fingerprint. This is uh, the, the plot is from the previous slide. So you know, falls near a retreating ice sheet, and you can see that there is a little bit of uh, rotational imprints as well. And together, very static sea level change uh, becomes spatially and temporally variable. And one thing to note is that this viscoelastic deformation happens over a range of time scale, and it depends on the earth structure, such as lithosphere thickness and mantle viscosity. So G GRD effects, has been typically um, studied in paleo time scale and paleo context. So just getting a little more detail into visco, this viscous deformational effects on sea level change. So all this GRD effects starts happening immediately after ice sheet starts evolving. And this effect goes over a long time. As I mentioned that it depends on the mantle viscosity and mesosphere thickness. And so this plot shows the present day rate of global sea level change associated with ice sheet melting since the last deglaciation. So last deglaciation, the deglaciation happened about 21,000 years ago and ended about 6,000 years ago. So there's no um, ice remaining in North America, for example, or in Finoscandia in large scale. So ice coverage on North America looks um, something like this. And so after ice sheet has deglaciated completely and this map of sea level change is for the present day. So this, these regions in red, for example, is where you're seeing solid earth uplift due to this memory of mantle. And so this is what, uh, this red region is where we are seeing the uplift. And when we um, go a little bit farther out, these regions are what it used to be called um, peripheral bulges. So during the deglaciation time, this near field place would uplift to uh, compensate, isostatically compensate the subsidence at the center of the ice load. So now that the ice load is gone, the center of the ice load is uplifting and then the peripheral bulge is collapsing. So we're seeing the ocean uh, subsidence therefore sea level rise. 
And in this far field region, the water is now filling in where the region, in the region where the uh, ocean, sorry, the peripheral bulge collapsing is happening. So therefore the sea level in the far field region goes down. So that's why you're seeing all these different patterns of sea level change due to the paleo ice sheets that are now gone. So this long-term effects due to risk of mantle is also called uh, glacial isostatic adjustment or GIA. So um, people have been using the word terms GIA or GRD effects sometimes interchangeably or sometimes just, um, just to refer GIA to the deformational effect part as well. So it's, it's uh, something that we always have to um, make sure we're speaking the right term and right language. And so modeling this sea level change due to GRD effects associated with ice sheet changes um, takes two inputs. And just to note, these models are also interchangeably called GIA, GIA model or sea level model or sea level earth model or GRD model. So in this talk, I'll use, um, I typically use sea level model. So I'll keep that terminology in this talk as well. So back to the modeling part, um, it takes a uh, sea level model take two inputs. And first input is ice thickness history. So for example, there's two snapshots of ice thickness. I represent ice thickness at 21,000 years ago. So during the last deglacial, uh, de last glacial maximum age and ice thickness at 6,000 years ago, you can see that there is difference and the GIA model basically takes how much ice thickness has changed and then try to solve the sea level physics. So the ice history are, is typically inferred from dynamic modeling or geological or geophysical data, such as paleo ice and sea level records, or for contemporary ice mass changes, um, inferred from brace or brace follow-on, satellite altimetry. And the second input is solid earth structure. So earth's rheological structure is um, schematic is shown here. It's not to scale, but we have the crust and lithosphere, asthenosphere, and mantle and outer core and inner core, and they all have different rheological um, profiles. And for the GRD effects, what really matters is the lithosphere thickness and the earth um, mantle viscosity for the upper mantle and lower mantle. And typically GIA or sea level models have assumed what is called linear viscoelastic maxilla rheology. So you have this viscous dash pot, which acts for a long period of time and the elastic uh, sphere, uh, lithosphere spring. So when you change mass, there's gonna be this instantaneous response spurt and then followed by a very viscous long-term response. And there are quite a large uncertainties associated with both of these inputs. So for example, for ice history in paleo context, there are just such huge error bars in paleo constraints. And because there are many geophysical based, geo geophysically based inferred ice history, um, typically ice history has been like built to match geological and geophysical data. So it doesn't necessarily respect ice sheet dynamics. So there is um, sometimes, a lot of times actually, there is no ice physics. And for earth structure, uh, we know that earth structure is laterally heterogeneous. It's, but then it's really, really hard to infer that it, even for 1D um, vari variations in earth structure is, is really uh, not very well known. So um, these two inputs have big uncertainties associated with different um, factors. And also just modeling capability wise, the model results are pretty sensitive to which rheological models one considers. So if one considers linear maxwell uh, rheology versus um, Berger's rheology, 
or it also depends on fluid types, non Newtonian or versus new non Newtonian mechanics or comp compressibility. So um, all these factors go into um, affecting numerical solutions of sea level change. So in my research, what I focus on is neither of this, um, but more on keeping the dynamic consistency between the ice sheet and sea level components. So typically GIA models or sea level models will just take in um, ice history that has no physics. And then, so therefore there is no feedback mechanism between um, ice thickness changes and sea level changes. When ice sheet changes because of the GRD effects, there's uh, fingerprints of sea level change that can also go and feed back into ice sheet dynamics. And there is no capturing of this physics um, in just this standalone sea level model. So there it comes coupling ice sheet models to sea level models. And before getting into modeling, I'll just also briefly touch on the physics of ice sheet, sea level, and solidary interactions. So we have these three components. And when ice sheets evolve, then it deforms, it causes deformation in solid earth. And when the solid earth deforms, then the surface of the ice also changes as well. So there is ice elevation feedback. And at the same time, ice sheet evolution perturbs gravitational field, and that causes redistribution of water loading or ocean loading. And that redistribution of ocean loading in turn causes deformation of the solid earth. And then that causes gravitational field perturbation as well. And in regions where ice sheets are marine based, the local sea level changes due to GRD effects. And that can also feed back onto ice sheet dynamics. So this plot shows um, marine-based ice sheet melting from solid line to um, dashed line. And the original grounding line is here. So grounding line is where ice sheet starts floating into water. And um, the ice flux across grounding line is proportional to the ice thickness at the grounding line. And that is in turn proportional to the ocean depth or local ocean depths there. So when ice sheet um, retreats or melts and grounding line retreats, um, if the ice sheet is sitting on a retrograde bed, so it's going deeper and deeper onto um, as you go towards the, the bigger part of the ice, um, if you had no bedrock deformation and or no sea level change, then you're just gonna go, go into this deeper and deeper, deeper portion of the bed elevation and therefore the grounding line, ice thickness at the grounding line is going to constantly increase and therefore it's going to uh, go on a runaway retreat, which is called marine ice sheet instability. Um, however, when you incorporate GRD effects and therefore see the capture, this see local ocean depth fall when ice sheet melts, then that is going to adjust the local ocean depth and then causes the ice sheet to a uh, grounding line to a uh, readvance or not readvance, but more like stabilize the uh, stabilize the ice sheet from being uh, going on a runaway retreat. So this mechanism or capturing this feedback mechanism is particularly important for um, projecting West Antarctic ice sheet because the West Antarctica in West Antarctica, the bed is very low, it's below um, depth sea level, and it's sitting on ice sheets, marine based, and ice sheets are um, sitting on this retrograde bed slope. So they're pretty um, imposed to go through uh, marine ice sheet instability mechanism. So I think I mentioned that this GRD effects or GIA have been studied in paleo context pretty much like it's, it's been considered as very important factor to consider in modeling paleo ice sheets. However, um, for projecting future ice sheets, this GRD effects have been typically ignored because, um, because historically 
future projections are focused on have been focusing on uh, the, their time scale for only for decadal or centennial time scale. And that time scale was typically considered to be not very important for this long term um, viscose response of the Earth. However, um, now we are learning more and more on how incorporating GRD effects might be important for projecting future ice sheets as well. And so there are only a um, handful of studies that really, really um, captured full GRD effects for projections. And those are two, these two, two, two studies published in 2015 by Gomez et al. and 2019 by Laro et al. So this plot just shows how important it is for projecting ice sheet. Although this study projected ice sheet for um, 5,000 years into the future, um, it's they their main result was that yes, full GRD response shown in this red line. Um, you can really see that the ice sheet starts losing mass um, less than compared to not not incorporating any of the GRD effects shown in solid black line. And this paper by Leroy et al. also focused on how important it is to maintaining high resolution and capturing elastic deformation of the solid earth following um, West Antarctic ice sheet retreat for the next um, 500 years. So these studies really suggested that, okay, if you wanted to also capture this GRD effects in future projections of Antarctic ice sheets, then you also really need to inco inc incorporate high spatial resolution and short-term coupling interval between ice sheet and sea level model. And the fast response of the Antarctica, well, sorry, um, this plot, uh, this this slide shows solar profile in Antarctica, and it really shows this really strong lateral heterogeneity. And so this thin lithosphere shown in the left plot, it really shows that in the West Antarctica, the lithosphere goes like it's pretty much below 100 kilometers, or even like 60 in some regions. And on the right hand side, um, this plot shows low mantle viscosity of mantle at 100 kilometers depth and 250 kilometer step on the right hand side. And you can really see that these rest Antarctic regions compared to East Antarctic region really demonstrate very, very low um, mantle viscosity to the order of 10 to the 18th. So together, the thin lithosphere and low mantle viscosity in West Antarctic region causes fast, faster response of the solid earth and the response time scale could be even um, decadal to centennial. So if one is trying to produce projections of the Antarctic ice sheet, especially focusing on the West Antarctica, then we, one really needs to consider the GRD effects in their projections. And as I mentioned so far, um, because GRD effects have been historically considered to be important for long-term paleo time scale, um, ice sheet projections mostly so far have not incorporated GRD effects. So this is ISMIT-6 Antarctic um, multi-model ensemble Antarctic ice sheet projection for the next um, 100 years or before uh, over the 21st century by Cirrus et al. in 2020. And so this is the very first version of ISMIT-6 project. And these are the participating ice sheet models. And uh, they did not, uh, I think none of none of these participating models included GRD effects or any sort of form of um, solid earth adjustment. So all the bedrock was fixed. And you take one um, model result. So DOE Mali was built at Los Alamos. So I took their results and just ran the ice thickness profile through uh, the sea level model. And this is the spatial and spatial fingerprint of sea level change associated with um, ice thickness changes between 2015 to 2100. So you can see that there is a significant sea level fall in the region 
in um, purple and blue and it goes far as you go farther away you get larger sea level rise and so um, we thought okay we really want to capture this GRD effects in the next generation of ice sheet model and our results submission to the next um, ISMIP 6 project. So coupled ice sheet sea level modeling happened or it works like this. So we have Mali ice sheet model and the sea level model is on a global grid. And what Mali does is it solves for ice sheet dynamics and takes a climate forcing from ice sheet model, uh, sorry, um, any sort of SMB forcing or ocean thermal forcing, and we use the one that's provided by ISMA 6. So ice sheet model provides the sea level model with ice thickness, and sea level model then captures the thickness changes and solves the sea level change associated with ice sheet changes. And then it feeds back onto the ice sheet model back um, how much sea level has changed. And this output exchange interval could vary between one to five years. We typically use five years for because West Antarctica, the solid earth response is pretty fast. And before we went on and applying this coupled model to the ISMIT 6 um, protocol, we, we wanted to do a, a resolution conversions test for model verification. So we just created a planar ice sheet model mesh uh, with varying sizes. And the sea level model grid is represented here is gauss legendre grid, where you have um, the same distance over different latitudes, but then your distance between, uh, distance along, distance of your grid points along each latitude gets closer and closer because the circumference of your um, circumference at different latitude gets smaller and smaller as you go toward the pole. And then we imposed a, um, an idealized ice sheet retreating scenario. So just put a marine grounded ice sheet in um, ocean depth of 1,000, 1000 sorry, 1,500 meters and just retreat the cylindrical model by two kilometers per year so that um, there is migrating of grounding line and also therefore the ocean area changes as well. So this is the uh, results or the convergence testing criteria. The very first one is very obviously ice mass conservation. And when you see uh, this is the results for Mali 32 kilometers mesh with gas legendre number of points of in the sea level model grid is 512. And you can see that we're just, this, um, this dotted black line is what is seen, ice mass seen in the Mali planar mesh. And because it's on planar mesh, you have to correct for aerial distortion. So you have to scale, scale up this mass so that it's on a sphere. And when you do that, this, you see that there are, this red line is right on top of the black line that is corrected for aerial distortion. So it's, it's, it's seen as only one line, which means that this ice mass is, ice mass is conserved when you go from Mali grid to the sea level model grid, which is shown in red. But you can see that there is this wiggle because this spatial scale of ice retreat is so much smaller than the scale of the mesh. So when you melt, when you when your ice sheet is retreating, it's the 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 pattern is not smooth. So even though the pattern is smooth, the Mali resolution is just not capturing that very well. So lower ice model resolution compared to the rate of retreat. Um, causes lower accuracy in capturing ice sheet dynamics. And when I then increase the Mali resolution by four kilometers, then you can start seeing these very um, linear changes in ice, which is what we want to see. And then the second testing criteria was calculation of ice sheet model contribution to sea level performed by Mali matches 
the one that's performed by the sea level model. So this is quite a busy plot, but essentially what you just want to look at is the line up between the yellow line and then the red solid line. And all these other lines are just demonstrating different ways of calculating ice sheet contribution to sea level. So the point I just wanted to make here is not only the mesh is important, uh, mesh criteria is imp important, but also depending on how one calculates ice sheet contribution to sea level, you can get such variable um, results. So I think that's something that we as a community need to talk about transparently on, okay, like how do we convert ice sheet contribution to sea level? What Which method do we use and which ocean area do we use? And I think being transparent and, and um, talking, having a very standardized uh, way of converting ice sheet contribution to sea level would be, would be very useful. Um, this is Mali's high resolution, so four kilometers. Sorry, I don't think I did a pretty good job on explaining what this plot was. So this is keeping Mali four kilometers resolution and also having lower um, sea level model number of grid points. So that's resolution wise, it's about 22.4 kilometers at latitude 73 south. So we have um, about five times larger sea level number of free points compared to that of Mali's. And this wiggle is basically carrying some interpolation errors. Whereas at the bottom plot, Mali four kilometers versus Gaswajandra number of points 2048. So that's about 5.6 kilometers at 73 south latitude. So that's less than one to two ratio and more close to one to one actually. And you can see that this red line lines up pretty well with the yellow line at the back. So you do this um, calculation of mean percentage error. So you just integrate these differences between the red line and the sol uh, yellow line over the whole time series and make a heat plot. And you can see that um, what really matters is the balance between the ice sheet model grid size and the sea level model grid size. Yes. So in the end, when we have this coupled model, what we've learned is that um, having a very high resolution in one model, but not in the other, mm -hmm. not on the other side is not necessarily very helpful. What's It's all about balancing between acquiring high enough precision and high enough accuracy by having comparable resolution in both ice model and sea level model. So now going into applying the model to real climate forcing scenarios, and these are all the model specs that I just put out there. Um, you don't have to go through the whole thing, but um, just wanted to mentioned that the resolution of the ice sheet model goes from four kilometers at the very end of the grounding line and to down to 20 kilometers. And we solve 3D first order momentum balance ladder between equation. And we have um, temperature-based solver and calving is fixed at the moment, but we plan to incorporate some more advanced and realistic calving mechanism there. And basal friction, we use power law of Q equals 1.5. And for the sea level model, we incorporate um, this whoops, resolution of spherical harmonics and degree and order up to 512, but keep the number of gas legendre rate points at 2048, as shown in the previous slides. And we also have um, two Earth structures. So one for East Antarctic condition, which is thicker lithosphere and upper mantle viscosity and lower mantle viscosity are pretty large or high compared to the West Antarctic conditions where the mantle, mantle viscosity goes down all the way to 10 to the 18th to 10 to the 19th Pascal second. And the lithosphere in West Antarctic condition is also pretty, uh, pretty thin. So that's 
half of what we impose in ACE concurrent conditions. And ISMIT-6 experimental protocol uh, was announced uh, about two years ago, and we just submitted, and Helen Servici et al. Um, submitted the paper last year, and then it's currently in review. And this is just to show what the experiment looked like. So there is tier one experiments that every participating modelers had to do, and tier two is um, optional. Largely, there are five, sigma five and six um, GCM models selected. So those are all represented here. And there are low emission scenarios and high emission scenarios. So RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 is high end and SSP 5, 8.5 uh, scenario was also a different type of high end scenario. And um, there are open, kind of semi-open um, selection for basal melt parameterization uh, protocol suggested by Jordan et al. And this, uh, this round, there was an open choice, fully open choice for GIA and GRD effects. So um, people could choose to not to include any form of bedrock deformation or any, any type of GRD. So for this work, for the coupled work, I've selected three experiments. And so this experiment AE1 is lower end forcing and A2 and AE5 are high end scenarios. So I've selected these three um, scenarios to compare ice sheet model standalone simulation versus coupled ice sheet sea level models. And just to mention this black or control run is basically a forcing that is just fixed in time. So we're applying constant present day climate forcing to capture the model drift and the committed sea level changes from, from ice sheet changes responding to the constant climate. And so for each experiment, um, I've run standalone uncoupled MOLLE simulation and also run coupled MOLLE and sea level with a structure characterizing or more suitable for the West Antarctic region versus um, a structure more suitable for East Antarctic region. So this is grounded ice mass change over time. So the simulation starts from 2000 all the way to 2300. Although the experimental protocol actually defines the start of the simulation at 2015. We've run historical simulation from 2000 to 2015. So that's what we include in here as well. And so each color represents different experiments. So control run, um, experiment A1, and the other two high-end scenarios. And the dashed lines are coupled MOLLE sea level results model result characterizing West Antarctic Earth structure. And dashed dotted line is coupled MOLLE and sea level model characterizing incorporating the East Antarctic Earth structure. So the slower response. And the solid line finally is the uncoupled standalone ice sheet model alone. And you can see that the mass loss is greater for across all the experiments for uncoupled scenarios. So this uncoupled model simulations don't um, incorporate any, any form of GRD effects and it has just fixed bedrock. And so you can also then see the coupling effect is the strongest when the response of the solid earth is faster. So um, incorporating the Western target ice sheet, for example, causes the ice, ice to melt um, slower compared to the coupled results incorporating the East Antarctic structure. And this is just simply converted to sea level change. So converting how much grounded ice mass has been lost um, to sea level equivalent relative to the, the beginning of the simulation. And the color bar remains the same. It gets a little busy, but you didn't have to read this. Um, yeah, so you can see that the sea level contribution is the highest for uncoupled simulation and the lower lowest for the um, coupled simulations 
incorporating the West Antarctic uh, Earth structure. So altogether, GRD affects delay mass loss and uh, faster solid Earth response induces longer delay. So West Antarctic versus East Antarctic structure uh, shows pretty big difference between the two. And the delay time in grounding line retreat is actually shorter for stronger warming. So for example, if you compare the delay between this line, this one to this one, that's going to be about like 50 years or 40 years compared to um, from here to here, it's a little longer than that. So, and in the blue line, there is almost no retreat. So there isn't much happening there in the first place. This plot gets pretty busy, but I just want to draw your attention to a specific region. So, for, uh, so first of all, this is ice mass change in different ismic six basins. So you have 16 different basins and calculate um, ice mass changes, grounded ice mass changes in different region. And what's really um, noticeable is that, first of all, you can see this um, difference between the dashed lines and the solid lines get large in regions where there are marine based ice sheets. So where there you don't where you don't really see the differences as much is where you don't really have marine based ice sheets. Therefore, there isn't uh, much room for GRD effects to kick in. And but these three regions, for example, Thwaites in here and Ross region here and Filchner Roni ice shelf region here, all in West Antarctica, um, they experience pretty big GRD effects. But Thwaites is dominating the effects um, from coupling. And also another thing to note that is this ice mass loss in West Antarctic region really dominates over mass loss in East Antarctica by even up to order of magnitude. And if you look at the grounding line evolution in lower um, control and low end scenarios, so this is showing constant climate control run uh, grounding lines at 2100, 2200, and 2300. And the, it's really hard to see, but these different color schemes represent grounding line evolution from different models, simulations. And the, the bedrock topography is also here as well. I just, there isn't much differences, so you can't really like see what's happening. But this is just to point out that when you don't have much happening in the first place. There is a grounding line retreat um, in West Antarctica, even in the um, uncoupled simulation, then there isn't much GRD effects kicking in because there isn't much happening in the first place. So in both of the simulations, um, in both of the scenarios, there is a relatively strong grounding, uh, stable grounding line. But when you go into now this, oh, actually, so I'm just zooming in a little bit into West Antarctica and grounding lines at 2,300. So very end of the simulation in low end scenario. And you can now start seeing a little bit of differences for uncoupled Mali um, ice sheet simulation retreated grounding line the most. And then there's coupled simulations in yellow and pink that is a little bit more advanced grounding line position compared to the uncoupled simulation. And this gray line is the present day grounding line. So the grounding line retreat happens all in all in these three regions in West Antarctica, but the GRD effect is pretty, pretty small. But moving on to high-end scenarios, um, so same plots, but showing different um, showing results from the high-end scenarios. So experiment two, CCSM4, RCP 8.5 scenario, up to 2100, there isn't much happening. But after that, in 2000, by 2200, there is pretty much a significant retreat in Ross and Fries region. And then after 2200, you get pretty dramatic retreat 
um, in the switch region. And same as experiment five, UK ESM SFS part five, 8.5 scenario, um, not much happening until in 2200, um, as far as the threats goes, but there is already a pretty sig very significant grounding line retreat in all of the simulation um, in the Ross region and Fritz region. And then between 2200 and 2300, the grounding line retreats very, very significantly in the Thwaites region. So there is extensive grounding line retreat in all different, all these three regions and the GRD effects um, are the strongest in Thwaites. So that means that if you look at this yellow line that incorporates, uh, yellow line is the coupled results, coupled model results incorporating West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, West Antarctic Earth structure, so faster response um, feels the strongest GRD effects. And the pink is the coupled um, results incorporating the synthetic Earth structure. And zooming into the West Antarctic region only, so keeping the same color scheme and just focusing on the experiment two, um, at CCSM4 RCP 8.5. You can really see that this uh, stabilization due to GRD effects in both regions shown in yellow, so for example, the coupled, re uh, coupled results relative to the, the uncoupled results, the, the grounding line is way up front. So, but however, there's also um, interesting thing interesting thing to note, which is that the GRD effect seems to be the strongest in the threats and then relatively insensitive in the other two regions, the freezing and um, Ross region. So in order to go a little deeper into that, um, we wanted to draw some transects, which is coming after, but this part first I'll show is the changes in ice thickness and topography that topography between 2015 and 2300. And so this is showing ice thickness change, um, selecting the experiment two scenario. And this is the coupled results. So sea level coupled, Mali sea level coupled West Antarctic Earth structure. You can see that there is a whole lot of ice going away in these two regions um, by the end of the 23, and the grounding line also has retreated from this uh, blue line, sorry, gray line, all the way into yellow, uh, yellow line. So there's significant retreat here. And the right hand side shows bedrock topography change. And so this orange is where that actually uplifts. And so there is this faster, fast uplift of the solid earth due to melting of the ice. And therefore you have this bedrock, um, bedrock uplift to where there is um, grounding line retreat. And so this is where you see the most um, strongest GRD effects of acting on, on the ice sheets. So going back to the transect, um, this is the thickness on the right hand side is the thickness of ice and the colors of the contour lines which represent, represent years of uh, the simulation. And so you have the CCSM4 experiment two um, scenario across, across the Thwaites region. And the top plot shows the results from uncoupled ice sheet model standalone simulation, and then the middle shows coupled model incorporating um, Earth structure for East Antarctica, and then the bottom one is incorporating coupled um, model incorporating West Antarctic Earth structure. And basically, what you see in the un uncoupled simulation is that at the very beginning of the simulation, you start knocking ice sheet a little bit and grounding line 
stays a little bit stable until relatively stable until the end of the 21st century and then it starts going away and between 23 22 and 2300 there is just massive ground and mine retreat when there is no GRD effects however in these two coupled simulation results you can especially the one that incorporates the western target earth structure you can really see that the grounding line doesn't retreat um, at least within the time frame of our simulation so before um, at 2300 year grounding line retreat it, it believes is um, only has retreated only by like less than 100 100 kilometers so that's a pretty strong coupling effects. And, and this coupling effect still was active on this retrograde slope in the um, in the Thwaites region. So the ground line position between this bottom plot and then the top plot differs by up to 2, uh, 200 kilometers, which is really significant. Patrick, how much time do I have, by the way? Uh, we're, at, we're at the hour now. Okay. Yeah. So I think I have a couple more showing. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And to show the Ross region, so that's here, it's so a cross section across Ross region, you can see that there is all retreat retreat happens in all of the simulations, regardless of um the GRD effects. So the this region feels relatively um it seems pretty insensitive to GRD effects. And in all simulations, there is about a kilometer per year grounding line retreat um, between um, 2100 to 2225. So yeah, that was um, something that's really interesting. And I'll get to the point what, why that would be, that might be in the end. And just to show the freeze region, lastly, um, this region also looks pretty insensitive to GRD effects, but in terms of the rate of the retreat, um, it's very different from the Ross region. So there was just very significant r rapid retreat just in 25 years in, in the freeze region in all of the simulations. And just zooming into the same plot, um, what's happening is between 2100, uh, 20, 2115 to 22, 2125, there's just like really, really fast re rapid retreat, both in coupled, coupled and uncoupled simulations. So just putting this into the context of the larger picture. So um, in courtesy of Helen Cerussi, I was able to, I'm able to show this plot, which is included in the draft of Vision of Six, and it's, it's currently being reviewed. Um, these show the grounding lines um, or by all of these participating ice sheet models in Thwaites region, um, so across this transect, and London stock ice rise here in Freeze region, and Cycle Coast in Rose region in the third. And pretty much all of the ice models in experience just very rapid retreat um, in this region, abundant stock ice, ice rise. And the retreat rate up, went up to 10 kilometers per year. And the very one thing to notice or note is this very, very smooth um, and very strong retrograde bed um, is exists in this region and so in my results where the GRD effects didn't do anything in this region it's basically it's just this this characterization is too strong and the treat rate is too fast that GRD effects just can't do anything with it so these are the results showing basically the same um, conclusions but for um, experiment five so different another high-end scenario and so I just wanted to highlight that regardless of which scenario you look at um, in high-end scenarios, you have very um, similar spatial characteristics on where GRD effects are the strongest, which is in the, which is in the race region.
So this is my last slide showing then um, the putting our results into context of more broader um, sensitivity test work that's been done by Trevor Hillebrand. Um, so he's drafting up now and he basically tested sensitivity of standalone ice sheet model uh, using Mali to incorporating different sensitivities to ice shelf melt uh, parameterization and um, incorporating different sliding low exponent, um, solving different um, formulation of energy balance and also mesh revolution and more. And basically um, the relative size of the spreads um, in each sensitivity test compared to the relative size of the spread in the GRD, coupled GRD work is the largest in the Thwaites region. So um, you see the size of these differences between the solid line and the dash line in the Thwaites region is really big compared to the Thwaites region and the Ross region. And same goes to these other regions, um, or, sorry, other results in, shown in purple. So Thwaites and Pine Island glacial regions show their largest sensitivity to different um, model parameters and model, model fidelities. So these are my takeaways. I probably won't read that, but um, this is, I'll just put it up here and, and while taking any questions, if, if anyone has any. So thank you for your attention and thank you for the invitation again. Thanks again. Um, do we have any questions? So I was wondering if you had plans to uh, couple this within a GCM simulation. Oh, what so if that might change the results. Or... Oh yeah, I mean yes, yeah, totally. So um, E3SM is it stands for energy um, ex uh, sorry exascale energy Earth system model and the big picture goal is basically to couple all of the model components. So ice sheet components coupled to sea level model now, but there is ocean component of the model and atmospheric component of the model. And then when they all fit in together, then I don't know how much of the GRD effects will um, influence the, the big picture atmospheric circulation and ocean circulation results. But yes, it's, it's going to be... That's the plan, yeah, to, to couple everything fully. Yeah. And you have a question? Hi, Holly, great talk. Um, I had a, a question about um, the examples you were showing at the end, the smooth uh, reverse bed slopes, is that because you lack the needed radar uh, lines to know what the bed topography is, meaning they're smooth because they're just sort of interpolated and filled in? Um, are, are, are there lots of sediments there? And so that's the reason why the bed is smooth in those regions as opposed to Thwaites? Um, what are your thoughts um, on that? Yeah, well, first, hey, Andrew, thanks. Um, it's nice to see you. I that's a really good question. I think it's um I don't have a good answer to that. I think the the uncertainty range is pretty big in that um in the bed machine. I think it you have to you would have to look at the the relative size of the spatial scale in that region versus the uncertainty bar. Um, so, and I don't have very good sense of what the uncertainty in the bed machine is, but given that this unsmooth topography is well captured in the, the other regions like Thwaites, 
I would assume that it probably isn't. Right, I'm trying to go back. Look, the smooth bed, negative bed in the the reservation is probably not due to um, some data resolution issue, but it's just a characterization of the the region. But I don't know why that place is particularly smoother than the the Thwaites region. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Thank you, Holly. Yeah. Great talk, by the way. Thanks so much. Any other questions? Well, I guess we can stop there. Anyone can connect with Holly offline if they have more questions. So, but thanks again, Holly. Thanks so much.